So let's start by Antonio Gramsci writing from Mussolini's prison cell. Labor activist whose work was mostly involved in uh, worker-owned cell phone managed uh, workers' enterprises, left social theorist. Uh, he discussed how societies tend to develop ideas and beliefs that reflect and support the prevailing structure of power, uh, creating a framework of beliefs and attitudes that becomes what he called hegemonic common sense, something we don't question. Uh, we just take for granted, uh, like uh, the air we breathe. Now, that tendency has, of course, been recognized before. It was a major thesis of uh, Marxist uh, thought, uh, had much deeper origins in modern thought. Uh, one of the most interesting is uh, David Hume, great philosopher David Hume, 18th century. Uh, he wrote one of the first uh, major works in what we now call political science, is on the principles of on the first principles of government. And he opens it in the first paragraph by writing that I'll quote him. Uh, he says we, he finds nothing more surprising than to see the easiness with which the many are governed by the few, and to observe the implicit submission with which men resign their own sentiments and passions to those of their rulers. When we inquire by what means this wonder has brought about. We shall find that as force is always on the side of the governed, the governors have nothing to support them but opinion. It is therefore on opinion only that government is founded, and this maxim extends to the most despotic, most military governments, as well as the most free and most popular. It's uh, far more significant in the countries that are most free and most popular, where the art of what Walter Lippmann called manufacturing consent has reached its uh, apogee, its most sophisticated application, since force, direct force is less available. Well, I think all of these thoughts merit careful attention. It's very useful to consider. It makes sense that when it comes to uh, prevailing ideals, who is invested, who is benefiting from you kind of holding those ideas? Because we kind of teach our kids certain ideas. Society teaches people certain ideas. Yet, who is the one benefits from these ideas? Now, you can argue that some ideas kind of benefit you, so they are kind of shared for mutual interest. But other ideas that are, are not shared for mutual interest, but for the interest of those who own you, essentially. And they don't really have much claim and justification for it, other than maybe some, some faint hope that, oh, you can also be them, perhaps, if you do certain things. Of course, that is not justification of why they have it. Like, okay, if all the same to you, then I, I will be there and you will be me. So that's not so great what we take for granted as unquestionable common sense, what we consent to without reflection, uh, not just what we consent to, but what we often go on to regard as the highest goal of life. So now suppose like, there was like a monarchy and there's like a king who's like, oh yeah, you know, anyone can be king, right? It's like, sure, but then I'm the king and you can be the peasant boy who's just doing your life. And like, maybe one day you can be king too, right? Not a problem. So in today's world, one of the highest goals in life is having a job. The best advice that one can give to a young person is to prepare to find employment. And that is to prepare to spend your waking life in servitude to a master. Uh, for many, that means subordination to discipline that is far more extreme than in a totalitarian state. So Stalin, for example, had enormous control over his subjects, but he didn't have enough control to tell them that uh, at 3 p.m. you can take a bathroom break for a couple of minutes. Uh, here's the clothes you have to wear all day. Uh, here's the way you have to behave when an unpleasant customer comes in. And in general, uh, this is how you have to live your life for most of your waking hours down to the lake. It's even more brutal these days because, like, you can just take your phone and, like, they even track you with that. So, you know, not great. Now, I have nothing against jobs necessarily, but if society doesn't have the option for people to support themselves outside of employment, then you're basically just channeling people into exploitation and they, they don't have a, a choice, right? I mean, that was kind of the the OG style that everyone just kind of had their own farm and like, just leave me the fuck alone. But now they don't have it. So like, just you got to pick your slavery. The last detail. And you might say that you're free to choose, but you're not free to choose because you're slave to your needs. And you got to play the only game in town. That's what's called uh, having a job. So all of this is quite apart from the ingenious means that have been developed and devised over the years to control the lives of the subjects uh, from Taylorism, its origins back in the 19th century, control every motion that a working person makes up to uh, the devices that are being made available by modern technology. Managers might keep an eye on the workforce, and now it is the uh, all-seeing eye of some remote computer. Uh, the major delivery services, UPS and others, uh, now describe how they are increasing efficiency thanks to the new techniques of surveillance. It means fewer drivers uh, achieving more and faster delivery. Uh, the method of well, the new devices allow remote managers to find out if the driver stopped for a cup, a cup of coffee 
or backed up when he was shouldn't have done it. So he can get an instant uh, notice of a demerit. Got another one, and you're fired. Uh, or uh, can find out in seconds whether an Amazon warehouse worker takes the wrong path and wastes two seconds, let alone stops to talk to somebody. Demerit, next one, you're gone. And innumerable other examples that are all too familiar, not only in the precarious gig economy, but in one way or another through the whole system of renting oneself for survival, holding a job, one of the highest goals in life. Well, that may be hegemonic common sense today, but it certainly has not been in the past. From classical antiquity right through the 19th century, the idea of being dependent on the will and the domination of others was considered an intolerable attack on elementary rights and human dignity. The hegemonic common sense of today is a very recent development, a matter worth pondering. In fact, all of this seemed so obviously correct uh, that dependent on a, dependence on a master is intolerable, so obviously correct that it was a slogan of Abraham Lincoln's Republican Party, which uh, regarded wage labor as differing from slavery only insofar as it was a temporary state until the person could gain freedom. But actually the most lively and eloquent and incisive condemnations and critiques were in the very vibrant uh, labor press of the early Industrial Revolution. They're written by working people, including what were called the factory girls, young women from the farms who were driven to the mills in the rising industrial system. Their writings are very much worth reading. They are available often in archival forms. Now, the Journal of the Knights of Labor, the great multi multinational, multiracial, multiracial union of the uh, 19th century America, uh, held this main slogan that when a man is placed in a position where he is compelled to provide the benefits of his labor to another, he is in a condition of slavery. Now, that was the standard assumption of working people, men and women, through the early years of the Industrial Revolution. You can't read these books. <laughs> Unless you read or not know. Revolution, right through the 19th century. One of the most articulate contributors to the working class protests against the reinstitution of a form of slavery in the rising industrial system. And one of the most eloquent voices was the an itinerant mechanic, Thomas Skidmore. Didn't have any formal education, but he was highly educated, uh, like many others at the time. He developed a serious critique of wage slavery, uh, founding it on the labor theory of value, as it had been developed by the classic economists, Adam Smith and David Ricardo, with whose work he and others were familiar. And on that foundation, he defined slavery as, in his words, being compelled to labor while the proceeds of that labor is taken by others, and went on to argue at length that no matter how property rights are attained, they are illegitimate if they're used to make some dependent on others, allowing some to appropriate to themselves the labor of others. The general labor press extended and deepened these ideas. It was vocal and articulate. It condemned, I'm quoting, the blasting, inf blasting influence of monarchical principles on democratic soil, referring to the wage contract. The workers recognized that this assault on basic human rights will not be overcome until those who, in their words, those who work in the mills will own them and sovereignty will return to producers. Then, but interestingly, when it comes to just property, it's always different when you just go back. You can never go back. That would be my main, main, main point, because it always starts with someone calling the dibs, you know, someone calling the dibs on, on something, and then, then kind of like just keep keep selling it. But if you just kept that this guy who had this before, it's like you, you would basically just go back to God, <laughs> if you believe in that, or no one. Essentially, I just uh, rule out dibs, but you don't get to call dibs after. Quoting, working people will no longer be menials or the humble subjects of a foreign despot, an absentee owner, so that they will be slaves in the strictest sense of the word who toil for their masters. Rather, they will regain their citizens as free, their rights as status as free American citizens. It was recognized that the Industrial Revolution had introduced a crucial shift from price to wage. So when an artisan sells a product for a price, he retains his person. When he rents himself to a master, he sells himself. He loses his dignity as a person, becomes a wage slave in the terminology of the time. All of these ideas were very much alive, of course, after the formal abolition of chattel slavery. I stress mm. formal because it was quickly reinstituted in 1877 as a new form of slavery, which lasted pretty much into the, to the 1930s and was the basis. It's interesting to emphasize that uh, the wage slavery is just not a new term at all, but an old one. <laughs> and I think many people don't even know this. They just just keep reusing it like it was some kind of newfangled thing that was uh that was uh, brought up in the last 10 years or something basis for the second industrial revolution in the south um, legacy still remains but in that context the notion of wage slavery became very prominent how is it different from chattel slavery well uh, the idea that uh, productive enterprise should be owned by the workforce was pretty common coin all the way through the 19th century and not just by Karl Marx and other left intellectuals but also by the major exponents of classical liberalism uh, the idea was part of the classical liberal tradition of the time. Uh, one person who's brought this out eloquently in his recent work is David Ellerman in his studies of what he calls neo-abolitionism. He mentions John Stuart Mill, the most prominent classical liberal figure of the 19th century, 
uh, one of the great modern intellectuals, uh, Mill, argued that, I'm quoting him, the form of association, which if mankind continues to improve, must be expected to predominate is the association of the laborers themselves on terms of equality, collectively owning the capital with which they carry on their operations, working under managers electable and removable by themselves. In other words, democracy in the workplace. That's the form of association to which the human species will ascend if it continues to improve according to the doctrines of 19th century classical liberalism. It's a concept that has very solid roots in the ideas that animated classical liberal thought from its earliest days, from John, John Locke, Adam Smith, and others. Some of the most eloquent and forceful development of these ideas was in the writings of Wilhelm von Humboldt, who's one of the founding figures of classical liberalism, uh, uh, also the founder of the modern research university. His words are worth thinking about reading and thinking about carefully. Uh, they're far reaching in their import. Uh, Humboldt held that freedom is the necessary condition without which even the most soul satisfying occupation cannot produce any wholesome effects. Whatever task is not chosen by man's free will, whatever constraints, whatever constrains or even guides him does not become part of his nature. It remains forever alien to him. If he performs it, he does it not with true humane energy, but with mere mechanical skill. Ideas, incidentally, which Humboldt also applied to the educational system in a manner which follows quite directly from the same thoughts. He went on to say that under the condition of freedom from external control, control, all peasants and craftsmen can be transformed into artists. That is, people who love their craft for its own sake and refine it with their self-guided energy and inventiveness, and who in so doing cultivate their own intellectual energies, ennoble their character, and increase their enjoyments. This way, humanity would be ennobled by the very things which now, however beautiful they might be, degraded. This urge for self-realization is man's human, basic human need, need from childhood, as distinct from mere animal needs. One who fails to recognize this ought justly to be suspected of failing to regard human nature as what it is and of wishing to turn men into machines. To determine whether the fundamental human rights are being honored, we must consider not just what a person does, but the conditions under which he does it, whether it is done under external control or spontaneously to fulfill a human need. If an artisan produces a beautiful work on command, we may admire what he does, but we despise what he is, an instrument in the hands of others, not a free human being. Uh, Adam Smith uh, developed a very sharp critique of division of labor, not what he's famous for. In fact, it's interesting that in the bicentennial edition, the Chicago edition of Adam Smith, the scholarly edition, there isn't even an index entry for Smith's sharp critique of division of labor, but it's there and it's founded on the same principles. Uh, Smith argued that a person who performs the same task over and over on command will become as stupid and ignorant as a human being can be, an outcome that must be prevented by government action in any civilized society. Only work that is freely undertaken using and enhancing one's own creative powers is an acceptable social condition. And that's the foundation of classical liberal thought. It's a very short step. For yeah, that is partly why it's done, because it disempowers the people, right? It, it obviously makes you depressed and you don't own the product of your labor then that's obviously also makes you helpless and depressed. So, yeah, I mean, the best way to be enthusiastic about what you do, even if the act itself is not necessarily enthusiastic, like, let's say, like cooking, you just, you just do the whole thing, the whole thing, like start to finish and you eat it, right? And even if you don't care much for the task itself that much, I was like, okay, not that bad, right? From these principles to the idea of control of all institutions, all communities within a framework of free association, federal, Free uh, organization through uh, agreed voluntary associations. Now that's the general style of very wide range of thought, including the main socialist traditions, the left uh, anti-Bolshevik Marxists, and much current activist work today of people seeking to gain control over their own lives and fate. The proliferation of worker-owned enterprises in the old Rust Belt in the United States, deindustrialized by neoliberal globalization in the interests of short-term profits of bankers and investors, uh, spread of cooperatives, uh, localization of agriculture, and many other initiatives of mutual aid with the long-term goal of creating the kind of cooperative commonwealth that was the explicit ideal of working people and farmers through the early industrial revolution. Uh, labor activists of the 19th century, late 19th century, warned of what they called the new spirit of the age, gain wealth, forgetting all but self. Uh, there have been massive efforts to instill this pernicious doctrine uh, in people's heads. Uh, the huge advertising and marketing industries spend hundreds of billions of dollars a year to achieve this goal. Much of intellectual culture and education is directed to it, and all quite consciously. If you read the press of the uh, highly class conscious business world, it warns of uh, what they call, quoting it now, the need to engage in the everlasting battle for the minds of men, to indoctrinate people with the capitalist story so deeply that they repeat it reflexively without thought. It should become common sense, mere common sense, to extol the merits of subordinating oneself to a master for one's waking life, to live a life of servitude to some foreign force. Uh, all of this was well understood by working people in the 19th century. In fact, workers in late 19th century New York warned 
that a day might come when wage slaves will so far forget what is due to manhood as to glory in a system forced on them by their necessity and in opposition to their feelings of independence and self-respect. They expressed their hope that that day would be far distant. In Gramscian terminology, they hoped to be able to block the efforts to, inst to instill a new hegemonic common sense in which workers would not only accept, but in fact glory in a system that turns them into menial and humble servants, as they put it, wage slaves under tight control, abandoning their independence for the larger part of their lives. In Hume's earlier terms, they hoped to present, prevent the imposition of the consent of the government that permits the masters to rule, whether in state or private government. The same ideas, I should mention, uh, relate to the general intellectual culture, not just the submission to a master for most of his life, the topic that George Orwell wrote about it, and suppressed work, work that you probably didn't read. Everyone has read Animal Farm, of course, but not very many people have read the introduction to Animal Farm, which was not published. Uh, it was discovered in Orwell's papers uh, 30 years later. Uh, the, the introduction to Animal Farm is directed to the people of England. It says, this work is, of course, a satire on the totalitarian enemy, but the people of England shouldn't feel too self-righteous about it, because in free England, in his words, ideas can be suppressed without the use of force. His title of his work is called Literary Censorship in England and Free England, and he gives a number of examples and a few sentences of explanation. And one in England, uh, not, well, you don't have freedom of speech. Well, you can say things, but I guess going after the government uh, will not be that hot. One reason, he says, is that the press is owned by wealthy men who have every reason to want certain ideas to be suppressed. But the second and more interesting idea is essentially Gramscian. Uh, if you had a good education, you've gone to Oxford and Cambridge, you have instilled into you the understanding that there are certain things that just wouldn't do to say. We can add, wouldn't do to think. That's manufacture of consent in the modern sophisticated term, the foundations of the liberal theories of democracy by Walter Lippmann, uh, Howard Laswell, founder of modern political science, all good Roosevelt, uh, Wilson, Roosevelt, Kennedy liberals, whose view was very much like that of the men who called themselves the men of best quality in the 18th century, the rabble 17th century. The rabble have to be suppressed. Uh, you can see this with people, especially those who don't expose their mind that much to like books and other kind of knowledge outside of education, <clears throat> which you should, that although they might be capable in, in a way that they're taught skills and possibly knowledgeable information, well, useful information, but how they think, they kind of like, they definitely drink the Kool-Aid and they definitely attended the indoctrination center for a little bit longer. And in a way they might be bad at, at just doing their own thing. They might have bad agency. If you take someone who's like, uh, who was like self-taught and just like did this all, all their all their childhood, and they might have extremely good agency. I mean, maybe they could be really bad at working for other people, really bad. But if you take someone who's like, who's like favorite word is yes, <laughs> you say what, I say yes, then they are really good at working, right? I don't aim to misrepresent them or uh, represent them necessarily poorly, but I mean, simply put, like you don't really have that much experience at being a self-starter and you have more of an experience at obeying and all these right ideas or you get punished. I mean, even that was my experience that I did not do anything wrong. I just did not do what they wanted me to do, which was wrong. Suppress. It's none of their business to become involved in public affairs. They're too stupid and ignorant, as Reinhold Niebuhr put it. Therefore, they must, in his words, be controlled by necessary illusions and emotionally potent oversimplifications. As Lippmann put it in his progressive essays on democracy, uh, people have a function, namely to be spectators, but not participants. Their function is to show up every couple of years, push a lever, uh, to pick one or another of us, the responsible men, who have to be protected from the trampling and the roar of the bewildered herd. Now, that's liberal, progressive, democratic theory in the modern period, traces far back to the suppression of the common people in the English Revolution, and in fact, to the US Constitution, which was a uh, constitution, of course, was written by a small number of wealthy men, mostly slave owners, who nobody else could spend a summer in Philadelphia in those days. And the uh, Constitution... Also, they were pretty young, too. <laughs> Just uh, wealthy, rich boys owning slaves, and America is like, oh my god, that constitution is so good. We cannot change that. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't good parts in it, but you can change it if uh, there are improvements you can think of. Constitution was, uh, actually its essence is captured in uh, the title of the leading scholarly work on the Constitutional Convention and Michael Clarman's uh, book, Harvard professor, called uh, The Framers' Coup, A Coup Against Democracy. The leading framer, James Madison, understood that the public had to be kept out of governing the country. They had to stop the threat of democracy that the public wanted. Now, therefore, there was a coup carried out by the framers to ensure that democracy wouldn't function. Madison's design, power was primarily in the Senate. 
unelected, not elected till 20th century. Uh, pick. But also, this is just bullshit because even if you go back to Aristotle, he figured out that yeah, if you have a democracy, then the people will just vote their own self-interest. So I mean, he figured that okay, maybe they should be like uh, they should uh, all get uh, part part of the the good the the country produces. That's gonna be a good incentive. But other thinkers were more along the lines of like, how can we oppress the people and and like kind of like have democracy in name? Because even these days, <laughs> you just vote for puppets, and you can pick the puppets. You can just vote on them. So that's not exactly a good choice. If a mugger came up to you and they said that your money or your life it was like, oh my god, yes, I'm free to choose. You are. Picked by elites. The Senate was to represent, as Madison put it. Why can you never vote on the body of the rich boys? Hmm? You don't want to? Put it, the wealth of the nation, those who recognize the rights of property owners and who understand that a prime goal of government is to protect the minority of the opulent against the majority. And that's the essence of the Constitution. Uh, in Madison's defense, you should say that he was basically pre-capitalist in mentality. He assumed that the wealthy men would be uh, the Roman gentlemen in the mythology of the day, uh, dedicated uh, to um, labor for the common good uh, with no self-interest. should say that... Have you read any Roman books? They were brutal. They, they were beyond brutal. Uh, I, I don't know which book I read. But basically, we just went around and killing people. Not that good. And it was oppression. Yeah. I'm not sure it's something to idolize. <laughs> I mean, I guess it's the earliest modern civilization, but it was uh, not that idea. It, fall, it fell to you, right? Adam Smith, at the same time, had a much sharper eye. You know, Smith described the existing situation in words that we can easily translate into today. Uh, he wrote in Wealth of Nations, 1776, that uh, the merchants and manufacturers of England are the masters of mankind, and they use their power to ensure to be, they become the principal architects of government policy, which they design to ensure that their own interests are very well attended to, no matter how grievous the impacts on others, including the people of England, but are primarily those who are subject to what he called the savage injustice of the Europeans, referring particularly to the British uh, destruction and deindustrialization of India at the time. And that was... More like, especially. That's the whole point. Because if you had power, and others had power, that's terrible. If you had power, even if, even if you cannot improve your situation at all, just by stripping others of their own power, you become the top top. Adam Smith. Okay. So if you're in a race and the other guy is just as fast as you, the best thing to wish for is a broken leg for them. Again, the terms are easily translatable today. I should say that it didn't take long for Madison to realize, to recognize the same truisms. In 1792, he wrote an eloquent letter to his friend Thomas Jefferson, uh, bemoaning the collapse of the experiment quasi-democratic experiment that he had designed. He said, government has been, power has been taken over by the stock jobbers, Wall Street in our terms. The stock jobbers have become the tools and tyrants of government, uh, overwhelming government by their combinations and benefiting from government's largesse. Very easy to translate that into 21st century terms. Many things in one form or another remain constant, including bitter class war waged by the highly class conscious property owning capitalist classes. Mm. Uh, in sharp, going back to the 19th century, in very sharp. You the idealistic to to even assume that th this is not the case. I mean, if you want to look at who has the power, just look at who has the money, right? That's it. Sharp reaction to these efforts to impose submission to the masters. They were very important rising movements of working people, and radical farmers in uh, what was then, of course, largely an agrarian society. The farmers movements began in Texas, moved up to Kansas, Oklahoma, Midwest generally, included most of the farmers. That's most of the working population. They were, this is what, was called the populist movement, not pop populism in the modern sense. This is traditional populism, radical democratic populism. And they were dedicated to solidarity, mutual aid. They created the most significant uh, democratic movement in American history. Uh, farmers developed cooperative institutions, cooperative banks, support programs, distribution programs. They wanted to escape the control of Northeastern bankers and the capitalist control of distributors. They had a good deal of success. Also, at the same time, that was true of workers in the industrializing Northeast. So in industrial areas of Western Pennsylvania, Cities were run by democratically elected working class groups, instituted policies leading towards the cooperative commonwealth that was their joint ideal. There were efforts to link the major labor movement, the Knights of Labor, and the radical reformers of the populist movements. And they were defeated, mostly by force and violence. The United States has an unusually violent labor history, much worse than comparable countries, to a very large extent a business-run society with a very highly class-conscious business class. Uh, and by the way, it's always force, right? It's always force. How, how are you going to make someone do your thing? 
It always have to be force. Nothing else. But the battle is never over. There's setbacks, there's violent repression, intense efforts to beat these ideas of independence and dignity and self-respect out of people's minds. But the struggle goes on constantly. In the United States, it's been very striking in recent years. During the recent neoliberal years, escalating under Reagan, uh, independent farming has been decimated. Uh, U.S. agricultural production has tripled since World War II. The number of independent farms has shrunk by two thirds. Uh, the size of remaining farms has tripled as highly subsidized agribusiness has displaced independent farms, greatly harming the ecosystem, maybe leading to species suicide, as well as harming, of course, individual lives. Right now in India, the same is happening on a very dramatic scale. Uh, since the neoliberal reforms of the 1990s, uh, over 350,000 peasant suicides have been officially recorded. Nobody knows how many there actually are. Uh, right now, the agricultural workers of India, mass of the population, are fighting for survival on the streets of New Delhi against the extent. I mean, that that's a, a twofold uh, issue. Because first, you want to price at the farmers, buy their farms for cheap and make a bunch of money, sure. But the the other side of that coin is to get all those people as laborers into the city. Because suppose everyone had a farm, right? And they decided, like, in India, that, like, you know, screw this civilization, I'm going to be a farmer. You know? They don't even care. They just, they just farm and, you know, eat their own food and live in a wooden shack, whatever. Doesn't work, right? We know those guys. City. Extension of these destructive measures. Uh, in general, a wide variety of attacks on the general population have been launched under the cover of neoliberal reform. I'm not romanticizing that life by any means. I'm just pointing out where why it could be problematic to certain interests. It's quite a remarkable scale and with very severe effects. Uh, take the United States, our prime concern. Uh, the Rand Corporation, quasi governmental, highly respected, uh, recently conducted a study of what they call the transfer of wealth from the middle class and the working class to the very top of the population. They're Technique gets the lower 90% of the population to the very top. They estimated the transfer during the 40 years of the escalation of neoliberalism under Reagan. Uh, transfer, incidentally, is a euphemism for robbery of workers in the middle class. Uh, they estimate the robbery in 40 years as a... Profit is just your money, man. <laughs> I think, yes, that the problem is that money makes money, right? So, obviously, that leads in one direction. And we have the game called Monopoly. $47 trillion. That's not small change. It's also very serious. 47 trillion? It's underestimate. Uh, following good neoliberal doctrine, Reagan opened the spirit spigot for other forms of robbery. One of the main ones is tax havens. Previously, they were illegal, and the laws were enforced by an activist treasury department. Uh, estimates of the robbery since Reagan run to an additional tens of trillions of dollars. Fair guess is that maybe something like 70 or 80 trillion dollars has been robbed from the working class and the middle class, uh, put into the hands of the ultra-rich during the 40 years of neoliberal reform. Uh, the Treasury Department used to have investigative departments which could enforce the law under the neoliberal programs, which incidentally are bipartisan. Uh, the uh, uh, Clinton made a huge contribution to them. The, uh, the, the uh, investigative uh, branch or the departments of the Treasury have been severely under, underfunded for good reasons. That means they can barely examine the rich. They don't even take the trouble to do it. You can't work your way through the tax lawyers, corporate law firms that have developed complex techniques of evasion. And so they don't examine the rich, which opens the door for additional forms of robbery with uh, huge numbers, but we can only guess them. Meanwhile, while this has been happening, real wages for non-supervisory workers, non-managers, have actually declined. Purchasing power has declined. That sharply reverses the pattern of the period of so-called regimented capitalism, the New Deal and subsequent years, uh, during which, uh, during that time, uh, uh, wages tracked productivity. Uh, during the 40 ne neoliberal regression, years of neoliberal regression, inequality has, of course, soared. Now the, the top 0.1% of the population, not 1%, 0.1% have doubled their wealth from 10% to a colossal 20% of total wealth. Uh, studies by Economic Policy Institute and others show that inequality is very closely correlated with unionization. The unions rise and fall, inequality falls and rises in tandem. Remarkably close correlation, the mechanisms are quite clear. Uh, Reagan yeah, but that will not work as well these days. Especially with the uh, load tracking and people don't have leverage, right? You you might owe nothing, right? You're easy to replace. They might outsource your work to third world countries and uh, with AI coming in. So, yeah. I mean, even if you unionize, I, I, I saw it, that people were unionizing and they were just getting fired relentlessly. So if you even just think about that the world, uh, you're just gonna get fired. And if the job can be moved, 
then they're probably just gonna kill the job. Even if it's not worth it. Just to... Just to make sure that unions don't exist. The last thing any company would want, any business would want, is that the workers get get a little emboldened, right? That's 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 not good for business. Also, even in, in just a, in a cold cold sense, I mean, if they can move the business and make more money, they're just gonna do it, right? So I'm not necessarily claiming that there is ill will about it, but if they can just make more money. If the unions win, they're like, yes, we're all going to make like two bucks more, or three bucks more. And they're going to like, okay, we're just going to move the factory. Knew what they were doing when they launched the global neoliberal assault with a major attack on unions. It's uh, necessary, of course, to destroy any means for working people to defend themselves against the state corporate attack. By now, mainstream economics, like economists like uh, Lawrence Summers, uh, reached the same conclusion that uh, the decline of unionization is the major, if not the major factor in the growing inequality. During these years, strike action has sharply declined. It's practically declined, declined practically to zero in recent years. It's a very good measure of the loss of defense against the assault. Precarity has sharply increased. By now, a majority of working people report that they live from paycheck to paycheck, no reserves in case of some emergency. Democracy, of course, declines with concentration of private power. Uh, similar developments have taken place in much of the world. In some respects, it's even worse in Europe than here. Uh, the structure of the European Union has transferred decision-making from national governments, which are to some extent responsive to their own populations, transferred from there to an unelected bureaucracy in Brussels, the famous Troika, unelected European Commission, IMF, major banks, mostly German and French banks. Of course, you can guess what kind of policies follow, including the highly destructive austerity policies. We're now seeing other examples in the incapacity to deal with the epidemic. Now, this has deeply embittered the population. It's led to anger, resentment, breakdown, collapse of the traditional parties. They barely exist anymore. Uh, the rise of uh, fertile terrain for the rise of demagogues of the Trump style, comparable ones in Europe, Modi in India, others who can use the opportunity, the breakdown to uh, impose deeply authoritarian and destructive policies. Well, yeah, but you can't even really vote for someone who it would make a big difference. And even if they advertise that, almost certainly they will not do it. Well, that's the great achievement of the neoliberal reforms. There have been periods of regression before. They've been over not like they would get into power. Come. The tasks are far more urgent, urgent now than they were in the past. We're in an unusual period right now. For the first time in history, we're facing threats even to survival of organized human life and not in the distant future. The increasing threats of global warming and nuclear war should be too familiar to require any review. The threats can be met. Feasible solutions are known to every one of the dire problems that humans face. What is not known is whether human intelligence and human will are capable of grasping the opportunities that exist. Now, they're not going to exist for long. If the opportunities are grasped and pursued, the path is open to a much better world, a world in which ideals of freedom and independence that prevailed for millennia can be revived, carried forward. You, um, global warming is actually very interesting because no one wants to... Well... I'm kind of phrasing it this way, but like personally speaking, if let's say would you pay to to reverse global warming? Let's say you have a choice between I'm giving you 10 million right now, or global warming gets a little better. Which one would you choose? Forward hmm? now, not restricted to some as in the past, but encompassing all. They may be suppressed now, these ideals, but not very deeply, I expect. We may recall Karl Marx's image of the old mole who keeps burrowing below the surface, not very far from the surface, then comes to the surface when the proper circumstances arise and an engaged public can break the fetters of submission and passive conformity. Can happen again. That's the hope for the future. It's in your hands. Thanks. I'm a little bit more pessimistic than Chomsky. He believes that things that didn't work so far could work if we tried a little harder yeah we'll see